I have the, the pleasure to introduce, we've had a great lineup this morning, we have a great lineup this afternoon. Uh, I have a great pleasure of introducing Len Zahn, who is um, the, the Grossbeck Professor of Pediatric Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also an investigator at HHMI, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, he's also the director of the stem cell program at Boston Children's Hospital. You'll, you'll note today that our speakers, their, their accolades are just, you, you, you don't know exactly when to stop. You have to keep going on and on. So I got, I got a few more here. No. Um, he's also, uh, so he received his uh, BS in chemistry and natural sciences from uh, Muhlberg College and his MD from Jefferson Medical College. Um, he's a household name among scientists. He's internationally recognized for his pioneering work in stem cell biology and cancer genetics, and he has been studying zebrafish uh, and using it as a model for study of blood and uh, hematopoietic development. Here come some more accolades. Uh, he is the founder and former president of the International Society for Stem Cell Research, the chair of the executive committee for the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Um, he's elected member of the Institute of Medicine in the National Academies, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he was recently, uh, 2010, awarded the E. Donald Thomas Lecture and Prize from the American Society of Hematology. So please welcome Dr. Lenzon. Thanks, uh, Josh. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, actually, I was at Tufts about six months ago at, for the pre-med society, so that was also a lot of fun to meet the talented students you have here. And I believe I was on Mike Levin's uh, PQE qualifying exam uh, as a graduate student, and I want to congratulate him on putting together this fantastic program. So today what I'd like to do is to um, tell you about our work on uh, blood stem cells. And um, blood stem cells have the ability to self-renew or they can differentiate into all the lineages. And um, it's the only stem cell besides skin that is used therapeutically, and this would be in a bone marrow transplant. And it's the only stem cell that actually has a real quantitative assay where we can tell the true number of stem cells. So um, we've been studying this in the zebrafish as a model system. You may know about the zebrafish. You can buy these fish uh, for $1.50 at a pet store. They're about one and a half inches long, and uh, we have about 300,000 of them at Children's Hospital. And the zebrafish is a fantastic system for studying blood development or hematopoiesis because the embryos are completely transparent, and you can just use a light microscope and see all the organs develop. They form blood within 23 hours, and it's circulating. And we've made transgenic fish that have fluorescent blood cells in every single different lineage that exists. Now, each mother has between 100 to 200 babies every week. Uh, we say daycare is a little expensive for the zebrafish. And um, <clears throat> uh, we can do genetic screens, we can do gene knockdowns or CRISPR experiments, and we can add chemicals to the water and see interesting things happen. So this is a zebrafish embryo at the four cell stage. There's two cells here and two cells behind the plane. And uh, we're gonna watch it develop eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells. And eventually it's sitting on this yolk ball, which is the nutrient supply for the fish. And the future brain will be on the right side and it rides up. And eventually what you will be able to see at the top is the eye develop. And then the muscles form, these somites over here, and then uh, the tail lifts off, and that animal is 19 hours old. So that animal has most of its organs. And so our thought was, um, if you look at a 19-hour-old zebrafish embryo, it looks very, very similar to a 28-day-old human embryo. And our thought was that if we understood how the zebrafish was put together genetically, um, we would have an insight into humans, and this might allow us to study disease. So <clears throat> we've been studying blood stem cells <clears throat> in this model, and um, I'm going to show you the birth of a blood stem cell. This is a 36-hour embryo, and there's the heart, and then there's the aorta, which is the largest vessel of the body. The blood stem cells are born in this aorta. The endothelial cells, or blood vessel cells, change their fate. They round up and form a blood stem cell. This stem cell could be transplanted at this time and rescue a patient, but normally these cells go into circulation. And they're gonna go round and around and around circulation 
and land in the next place where blood cells will be forming, and that ends up in the fish in its caudal tail, in its tail region. Um, in humans, it would be the fetal liver. The stem cell attaches to the vessel wall and transmigrates into the niche where it starts to double. And then the stem cells go back into circulation and they'll colonize uh, the next site where blood cells are formed. In the fish, this is in the kidney. In you or I, it would be in your bone marrow. And some of the cells actually bypass the kidney and they go to the thymus, which is the beginning of the immune system. And all of this allows uh, the animal um, to have blood uh, throughout its entire lifetime. So we know that we see these events live, so they exist, but we don't know the molecular biology of how this happens. Also, if you think about how those cells travel through the vasculature, it's very similar to when I do a bone marrow transplant on a patient and infuse the cells into the patient's vasculature, the cells ultimately will home to the marrow. Now, I've always wondered as a clinician and as a hematologist, um, you know, what does it look like when a stem cell lands? And um, unfortunately, we're all opaque, so I can't really uh, know from doing a clinical experiment. But in the fish, we've been able to label the stem cells green. And in this experiment, we labeled the blood vessels red. So the stem cells are born in the aorta, and they're green. They go zooming around circulation. And now I want to show you this stem cell landing where this circle is. So the stem cell comes in, transmigrates, and then we saw something quite strange. The endothelial cells wrap themselves around the stem cell in a process we called endothelial cuddling. Then there's a division, 110 degree turn, and one stem cell leaves and the other one stays. So this is a very dynamic process, much more dynamic than I ever thought from the clinical side. And it gives us the opportunity to understand those steps and maybe be able to manipulate them clinically. So we took this very embryo and we actually sent it to Ohio. And there's a company that sections through the embryo and does something called correlative electron microscopy. They located the stem cell for us, and this is the highest resolution of any stem cell niche that's ever been shown in a vertebrate species. And what we saw was very interesting. Here's the blood stem cell, and it's surrounded by five endothelial cells. Now, this forms a pocket, and the pocket may allow for high concentrations of growth factors that stimulate the stem cell, or it may protect the stem cell. But we also saw it attached to this stromal cell, which is a nurse cell, a supporting cell. And that was quite surprising because this cell had gone all around circulation just to land and find another cell. So we wondered, what do the stromal cells do? So in this case, we've made the stromal cells red and the green cells are stem cells. And what you can do is watch and the stem cells divide perpendicular to the plane of the stromal cells. So it seems that the reason they find a stromal cell is to orient their polarity of cell division. So we've been observing all these amazing things. And recently, we have some um, really interesting interactions with macrophages, which are typically immune cells that are fighting off bacteria. But here what we see is the stem cell arrived in its location. And the red macrophage is actually eating part of the stem cell part of the cytoplasm of the stem cell. We think it might be removing a cell surface that's required, a receptor which is required for um, being able to engraft. So that's a very interesting behavior. We're trying to understand it at a molecular level. <clears throat> but the other thing that was strange is um, over here is the stromal cell, and the macrophage and the stem cell are interacting here. And we wondered, how does a stem cell get to that stromal cell? So what we found strangely was that the macrophage passes the stem cell on to a second macrophage that body slams the stem cell against the stromal cell. So it's quite amazing physical forces. We wonder if integrins are involved. And again, we're trying to dissect out on a molecular level by doing techniques like RNA-seq and, and uh, single cell RNA-seq with Jim Collins and others um, to be able to understand this. Now, another fundamental question comes up is just how many stem cells are born um, in the aorta? 
And um, the reason this matters is that <clears throat> we have a diversity of stem cells for life, and you only have the birth of the stem cells once in this aorta region. So in this experiment, we have these zebrafish called brainbow fish. So brainbow fish have plasmids throughout their genome, 15 to 20 copies of red, blue, and green. They have recombination sites here, and so if you mate them to an enzyme that cleaves these recombination sites, certain colors can come out. And just like the old television sets that were the RGB TV sets that could dial up any color of the spectrum, we can make cells multicolored. So in this experiment, what we did is to label just the blood, and we made all embryonic blood multicolored. And then what we did is grew them up to adulthood. And when they're adults, we would then be able to look at the colors in the adult blood. Only stem cells could have um, made those cells for that long. And then that number of colors will correlate to the number of stem cells that are born at the very beginning. So this was a very fun experiment by John Henniger, a graduate student in my lab. <clears throat> and um, this is uh, multicolored blood, OK? So all the blood is different colors. And if you focus at this particular place right there, um, what you can see is a green or blue stem cell that divides. And that's a stem cell because it's in an extravascular location. So that stem cell, when it grows up to adulthood, will make blue blood. Okay, so now we can grow up those animals to adult and I can do a peripheral blood smear just like many of you have in the laboratory um, for regular routine blood counts. So this is the blood smear of that animal, okay? And um, you know, I'm a hematologist and I can tell you this is the prettiest blood smear I've ever seen, right? And um, we were able to um, um, try to figure out are these uh, cells clonal and um, one of um, my graduate students came up with an idea to study these individual colors. He needed to make fish that were one color because then we could study the marrow and make sure that the different colors are truly representing clonal decisions. And so he was able to do this by having a ubiquitous Cree and this would end up causing all the sperm to be different color. So then every animal was a different color. So uh, this is the picture, and this was the cover picture, and actually those are the real colors of those fish. And um, we checked out their marrow, and it turned out that at the beginning of, in the aorta, there are 20 stem cells made. So the beginning of your diversity is 20 stem cells. So now that we've been able to mark clones of stem cells in different colors, we've started to think about how to use this information clinically. And there's a new disorder that's been found in humans. In 70-year-old patients, um, about 10 per, I should not, patients, 70-year-olds, 10% um, have mutations in their peripheral blood. Of 80-year-olds, 30%. Of 90-year-olds, 50% have mutations. And what those mutations do is to expand a clone of stem cells. Now, this is a way in aging of being able to maintain your regenerative capacity, but it also predisposes you to leukemia because you could have 50% of your blood being driven by one stem cell. So it's a tremendous stress on the system. So um, the mutations that happen are in epigenetic regulators that seem to change chromatin in these cells and cause this expansion. So we have the perfect system to understand how this aging process happens. We label every stem cell of a zebrafish embryo in different colors. We add um, transgenes or CRISPR to target these regulators that happen in humans. And then we look for expansion uh, in our fish. So over here are all the mutations that cause these um, expansions in humans. And what we do is either as a pool or single clones, we inject them into our brainbow fish, make the blood multicolored, but what we're looking for is a single color to become dominant, and that would mean that we've actually modeled the human disease. And um, sure enough, we've been able to find a gene, ASXL1, um, where normally you have multicolored blood, but in ASXL1, 50% of the blood is coming from a single clone. And uh, this happens in humans. 
And now we can see if we can reverse this, which is, a, I think, a, a very important thing to do clinically. But we can also mate this to um, another clone that is the oncogene that would cause leukemia, and now the fish gets leukemia. So we're able to study how cancer begins in this particular process. So I talked a little bit about um, bone marrow transplant. Again, this is a process that I've done uh, for patients, uh, for my patients. And um, again, it's somewhat anticlimactic to do a bone marrow transplant on a patient. You know, when you're a surgeon, you show up with an organ and you sew it in and everything. But, you know, when you do a bone marrow transplant, you show up at the bedside, you got a bag of, looks like blood, but it's marrow. And then I start an IV and I put it into the veins and the cells know how to get there. And this process is called homing. And so this happens probably within 16 hours, but up to 48 hours. Now then there's this process called engraftment. And I'm always asked, what is engraftment? Okay, so now I want all of you to think about when you were in college and you took your final exams. Okay, and now you went home. Right, so what did you do for the first three days when you were home? Sleep, right, okay. <laughs> And then day four, you wake up and you're in your own bed, right? So that's engraftment, okay? <laughs> now, a single blood stem cell, one cell can make all six pints of your blood. And you only need to do this process once. It's curative. But still, 25% of patients die from the transplant. And one of the reasons they die is an inadequate dose of stem cells. So we decided to try to find a drug that would increase stem cells. And um, we did this using the zebrafish. We mated the fish so you produce lots of embryos. And then we took a 96 well plate and put five embryos in one of the wells. And then we added a chemical to the well. Then we took another well and added a different chemical. And we screened a library of 2,500 small molecules of known action. So about a third of these libraries are um, FDA approved drugs and we stained them for stem cells, and what we found were 35 chemicals that increased stem cells, but there was a big winner, which was this dimethylprostaglandin E2, and this really stimulated a lot of stem cells. So um, I really was excited about thinking for therapy in this realm, and uh, in the mouse system, we have this stem cell assay that's quite remarkable, which is called the competitive repopulation in limit dilution. And uh, what this is, it makes use of the principle that stem cells, uh, maybe like Tufts undergrads, can be competitive with each other. And uh, so you can take a red stem cell, um, treat it with the chemical, and for two hours, ex vivo, add in yellow untreated marrow, transplant into irradiated green mice, and use flow cytometry to determine how much blood came from the red mouse versus the yellow mouse. And what we saw was there were four times more stem cells that engrafted with prostaglandin. And another laboratory repeated our work and got the same answer. So we decided to take this to a clinical trial. And we had 12 patients who had leukemia. <clears throat> they didn't have a marrow that was a match, a brother or sister, let's say. And they went on to umbilical cord units. Um, umbilical cords have stem cells. Um, they work really well, but there's very, very few stem cells in each cord. So the standard of care is to give patients two cord blood samples. So this gave us the perfect opportunity to actually repeat the mouse experiment, but this time in humans. And this was the first time this was ever done. But we took one cord blood, treated it with the chemical, left the other cord untreated, and put them both into the patient. These two babies' worth of stem cells have different DNAs. So you can simply bleed the patient and look at their polymorphisms in their neutrophils and see where the blood came from. And what we saw was in 10 out of 12 patients, the treated cord was the one that dominated. And that was consistent with our hypothesis going in. The neutrophils and the platelets also came back more quickly. And um, this seemed to be very, uh, seemed to work at least um, in a preliminary study. Now, as a physician scientist, this was one of the best events for me because being able to have something in your own laboratory and bring it into the clinic, it's quite remarkable. So we've gone on to treat 48 more patients. Um, we see a similar trend. Um, the patients also have less graft-versus-host disease. This was unexpected. 
but there are T cells in the cord blood that seem to respond to prostaglandin by reducing graft versus host disease. That's, of course, a good thing. And uh, the company that I started, Fate Therapeutics, as a result of this work, is now doing phase one and phase two clinical trials to be able to um, see if this works as an anti-graft versus host disease in marrow transplants and um, peripheral blood transplants. So, um, you know, we transplanted mice and we transplanted uh, humans, and so I figured we needed to transplant fish. And so um, we have here what I call the Dr. Seuss experiment. So we have a green fish and a red fish, and we take the green fish's marrow and incubate it with a chemical. We add in untreated red marrow. We transplant into a transparent adult fish that we created called Casper. And we don't need to bleed the fish or kill the fish. We just take a picture in the green and red channel. And what we're looking for are drugs that increase the green to red ratio. So um, we were able to find a chemical, 1112-EET, that works in the zebrafish. It also works in the mouse at the stem cell level. And one of the surprises here is that from a biochemical property, prostaglandins come from this chemical arachidonic acid through the COX enzymes. When you take an NSAID or Motrin, you're blocking prostaglandin production. Here what happens is there's specific enzymes in the body, CYP enzymes, that add an epoxide to arachidonic acid, and these are also active at stimulating stem cells. So for many years I was looking for proteins or sugars that would increase the engraftment of stem cells, and I think what we're finding is these small inflammatory lipids are actually the ones that work very, very well. So um, a summary of where we're at is that we have a stem cell that has um, CXCR4 on its surface, and it comes into contact with the ligand, which is on the endothelial surface, um, and this causes the attachment of the stem cell on the vessel wall. It needs to change its shape to transmigrate through, and it waits for a signal like EATS, or maybe another signal, S1P, and kind of pokes through. And once it pokes through, it will um, uh, eventually come in contact with those endothelial cells. And the endothelial cells will actually um, execute the cuddling reaction. And uh, you'll see that in a second. And what it happens is um, this cuddle brings it into apposition with the stromal cell. So then the divisions of this stem cell actually occur out from the stromal cell. And you'll see that in a second. There you go. So that's a division. So um, the zebrafish is a fantastic system for looking at disease also. And um, one of the diseases we've started to study are the ribosomopathies. So in these systems, they don't uh, translate proteins very well because they're mutated in some of the subunits of the ribosome. And uh, this causes um, P53 to get activated, and the cells end up dying. We have a mutant fish uh, that has anemia. You can see here blood in this animal, but in the mutant, there's no blood. But if we mate this to a P53 mutant, you rescue back blood. So that was very exciting, and we see patients in the clinic who have this disease as a very bad anemia, and there's no treatment for these kids. So we decided to add chemicals to the water of the zebrafish to see if we could find a therapy. And lo and behold, we found something called calmodulin inhibitors. Multiple calmodulin inhibitors nearly completely rescue uh, the zebrafish. So um, we took those into human cells, and these are human CD34 cells, blood cells, and we knocked down an RPS gene. And um, what happens is normally, um, there's a less differentiation of the blood cells. But if we add this drug, trifluperazine, you actually rescue back those cells in humans. And also the P53 pathway is uh, reduced. Um, we actually got a human bone marrow sample from a patient. You can see they're very, very anemic here. And if you give this drug, you almost double the amount of blood that the patients would actually have although you can see nowhere near the level that you'd get from a healthy marrow. And we took this into a mouse model of RPS deficiency and added this drug, 
and um, what you see is a rescue of hemoglobin with this chemical. So this is very exciting, and we're actually going to take this into the clinic um, with a patient, uh, with ten, 10 patients or so, and that clinical trial will start sometime over the next year. Now, the way that this works is actually directly affecting the translation of P53. And um, the trifluperazine actually seems to rescue back, um, lowering the level of P53. So the model that we have is that you um, have uh, RPS deficiency. This increases the P53, causing the stress of the red cells and targeting them for death. But if you give that trifluperazine, you rescue this biochemical process, and the red cells actually live. So it's a use of the zebrafish to study disease. Now I want to just close with uh, some of the work that we've been doing in cancer in the zebrafish model. And we've been studying a disease called melanoma. This is a devastating disease in which a mole may transform to become a deadly melanoma. And it does this by having new genetic mutations that actually occur. So if you, um, we all have moles, so don't worry. Um, uh, but you, if you have a mole, you have a 95% chance of having an activating mutation in a gene called BRAF in the mole. That causes the proliferation of the mole. Most moles become senescent, and so nothing happens. But ever so often, a single cell will transform. And that cell, um, if it goes beneath the dermis, um, will cause uh, metastatic melanoma. And that's a very deadly disease. So we modeled this in our zebrafish by taking the human gene and driving it in melanocytes. And you can see here the moles that we got. Now, when we did this, nobody actually cared because we had the world's first model of moles. Um, but um, we mated this to a P53 mutant, and you can see here that you get melanoma. So recently, we've been studying this gene called Crestin. And um, Crestin is on in all of the neural crest cells, which are the stem cells for the melanocyte. And it's shut off during development, so adults do not express this gene. But when the tumor comes on, the gene gets turned back on. And um, so Chuck Kaufman, a postdoc in my lab, took the Crestin promoter and drove green fluorescent protein. And we could watch live how the neural crest develops. Look at these stem cells as they migrate. And look at the eye over here. And you can see the cells kind of invading into the eye, kind of just like cancer would. So this gave us a window on how the stem cells develop. Um, but we were able to um, mate this to our tumor model. And this is a fish that's got a melanoma on its head. And one of the things that we could do is shine a light on the melanoma and the tumor actually glows green, which was really, really uh, fascinating. Now, Chuck followed these fish, and ever so often, he would see a fish like this. That fish is completely normal, no evidence of any disease. But when he shined a light on this fish, um, there was a patch. And any time we saw a patch of green, 100% of those fish got melanoma in that location. So we decided to push this a little bit further, and Chuck followed an entire cohort of fish, and he was able to see this. This is the fin of a zebrafish, and this fish has one green spot, one green cell, and that's that cell there. And so we are the first people to ever see cancer at the one cell stage. And 100% of the time, that became the tumor. And you can see how it jets out a little pseudopod here and then starts to divide. So this was quite uh, remarkable. And um, we were able to take patches of cells that have the turned on the green marker, and these cells actually turn on the neural crest program. So we believe the melanocyte has actually been reprogrammed. So schematically, we have during development, the neural crest cells will actually make the melanocytes. And uh, these melanocytes um, are normal, but in an adult that's predisposed to getting cancer, a single cell um, will actually back up their melanocyte and go back to a stem cell fate. And that is the first event initiating cancer. The genes that get turned on in the cancer are the same genes that get turned on in the stem cells of the neural crest. 
And so our thoughts are that um, you have a, a field, let's say a mole represents a field of cells that could become cancerous, and um, what is needed for it to become cancer is for this change to happen. There's a neural crest activation, activation of super enhancers, and then these things will actually cause the start of the tumor. And this will actually lead uh, to the progression. So our thoughts and what we're trying to do now is first develop diagnostics. We're studying human tumors for this specific gene expression signature. And we think this might represent moles that, divide, that we should do a wide excision on, so to do diagnostics to help people understand what the best treatment would be. But really what I'd like to do is to actually have a cream and shut off these super enhancers. And that would stop the cancer before it even began. And so that's what I really want to do. So we've been studying the epigenetic landscape of this. And um, we've been able to screen for factors. And here's one such factor. And there's one fish that just has a control plasmid, and the two fish have been injected with this factor called SATV2. And in this particular case, it, me it seems to make the tumor want to metastasize. So we wanted to prove that this was a metastasis type of screening. We developed an assay where we could layer the cells on the dorsum of the embryo. And these cells, these melanomas, would never go down the embryo. But when we have the SAP-B2 overexpression, you can see the tumor spread live, even at the single cell resolution. And you can see perhaps on this fish, like this little metastasis that's come down. And uh, this is really, really helpful. We've studied these um, by doing uh, ChIP-seq to find out what the chromatin factors are that are activated. And there's enhancers that are activated. And what happens with this particular program is the tumor cells jet out these invadipodia. So the tumor, this oncogene, seems to drive invadipodia, which makes the tumors invade more. And you can see this, actually, um, in gelatin, where the tumors that have this particular transcription factor um, cause holes in the gelatin, which is they're trying to invade. So we think we're on our way to discover this pathway that's involved in the neural crest development and in uh, metastatic melanoma. So now we're trying to screen for drugs that would block this process. And so we found one drug that completely erases the neural crest. And this drug affects nucleotide biosynthesis. And um, in combination with a BRAF inhibitor, seems to reduce tumors. And so this has led, actually, to a clinical trial um, where we're actually uh, treating uh, patients with leflunamide, this drug that we discovered that's an arthritis drug, I should say, and then um, treating them with a, a MEK and a BRAF inhibitor. And so that's been very, very exciting, and we'll see what happens in those patient trials. So um, one of the things that we've been wanting to do is to, we always end up trying to go to human tumors to do our preclinical work. And this is kind of frustrating because we've set this up uh, over the years to work in zebrafish. And so we decided to try to do a clinical trial in a zebrafish. And um, this was a little bit hard because we had to figure out how to deliver um, chemotherapy or drugs to a zebrafish. So what I want to show you is a video on um, oral gavage of a zebrafish, an adult zebrafish. So um, Michelle Dang, one of my graduate students, fits this needle with a little piece of plastic. And um, we put the fish in two different types of anesthetic, keep it happy. And um, so we put it in one anesthetic. And then we, with a little teaspoon, uh, move the fish to a, another uh, anesthetic that has fluorocarbons, so it maintains its oxygen. And then what we do is we take the fish out and put it in this mold and um, in this sponge. And we kind of prop them up, OK? <laughs> and uh, then we go in with verafamib, which is the drug that we would use clinically to treat patients. And we um, inject this into the intestine of the zebrafish. And they tolerate this perfectly well. And, um, and we've been able to do our clinical trials in our zebrafish uh, hospital. So just as a last slide, um, you can see here um, that um, this is the tumor growing normally in DMSO. 
but if we give the drug, you get this huge necrosis of the tumor. But in this particular tumor, we've put in a resistant melanoma, genetically engineered, and it doesn't respond. So this is the beginning of what we'd like to see as clinical trials in the zebrafish system. So um, I just uh, want to thank the people who've done the work. Um, this is my laboratory. I think I mentioned everybody uh, along the way. So thank you very much, and happy to take questions.